Adam something video is really long and very densely packed with complete lies, misinformation. So I'm trying to decrypt what exactly he says and, and telling you how it's wrong. I'm, I'm sorry, there are no pictures, but you can just listen to it and it should be informative. There's much to be read and said about the EU and he just skips over all the relevant information and just gives you very bad opinions about things. He doesn't understand how the EU works. He doesn't understand the frustration many people have with EU and he insults our intelligence by compiling facts that have nothing to do with anything. He doesn't understand geopolitics at all. And it's very, very frustrating to listen to. It's only, it, it's maybe 20 minutes long about, but I, I'm sorry my video is so long, but there's so much to say and so much is wrong here. So I hope you enjoy it. So let's get to it, shall we? What do we understand under a European Federation? It's a system of governance where the local governments transfer some of their tasks to an overarching federal body so that those tasks can be better coordinated on a continental level. And here I'd like to make a note that federalization doesn't involve centralizing everything. Uh, we're not the Soviet Union, after all. I'm happy you say that also, but uh, we'll see uh, you don't agree with yourself. As we'll see later on, we're talking about the strategic centralization of certain parts of government. The question is, which parts of government? Because in the European Union, we have directives and we have directives about everything. We have directives about the size of matches. We have directives about power, which have made the prices skyrocket. We have directives about energy that are a catastrophe. We have directives about education, which are breaking the French system, for example. We have di directives on transport that are pure, pure shit. And we have all these directives and governments must enforce them. Governments, to get the money we put in the European Union to get our money back, we have to do these policies. And these policies are very unpopular. And that's what the European Union is all about. You take public things that the people paid for and you make them pay for them again. That's all the European Union does in France, where I live. It's all it does. We paid for roads, we have to pay for them again. We paid for power plants, we have to pay for them again. And the prices are, are horrible. It's, it, it's a complete disaster. That's what you're calling for, essentially. Decisions about local issues would continue to be made locally, of course, unless they contradict some kind of overarching goal. That's just perfect. So our decisions have to go through the filter of people we don't elect. Because in the European Union, what has power is the Commission. And the Commission does not care about us in any way. The Commission has other objectives. So they're like people that are elected in an indirect way that we can't get rid of. And the people we actually elect just sit around and cost us a lot of money. That's what the European European Union is. So if you want federalization in, a, in a, something like in the US, we have to redo everything. It's corrupt to the core right now. So in practice, in a European Federation, the European Parliament would be an analog for the House of Representatives and the European Commission would be an analog for the Senate. Too bad things don't work that way. Of course, I'm talking about the US government here. The president would either be nominated by the parties or directly elected. That's just preposterous because, well, European demographics make such elections crazy and we have no Europe-wide parties so that's just well that's just shit then. A European Federation would also involve common military, common foreign affairs, common finances and a common border security and asylum system among other things. That's just bullshit because in the US, for example, which is a federal state, or in Russia, which is also a federal state, they don't have those things. At least they don't have it for the border. They, they, they have a military that's common, but like military units come from some part of the country. They're not, many times they're not very federal. Like, I, I don't know what you mean exactly. And in Europe, this can't really work because people just don't trust each other at all. Like, this is this just can't work. So this is my rough sketch of what a European Federation would look like. So basically, certain key aspects of government would be under common federal control. So would this system be viable? Before the recording of this video, I asked you to give me your best arguments against the European Federation. Best arguments against the Federation, and now we're going to address them one by one. Now, almost all counter-arguments involve some kind of rift within Europe, which could make the Federation idea non-viable. Irreconcilable differences, as they say. But are they? The first argument is the conservative versus progressive divide. For example, Sweden is a haven of progressivism, while Poland is the European Taliban. And the argument, of course, is that the ideological rift between the conservative and progressive parts of Europe is so large that the European Federation would be non-viable because of that. The question here is, 
what is liberal and what is conservative. You don't tell us. Simply put, we don't know what the hell you're talking about here. Are they conservative in social ways or in, in economical ways? What does this mean? Like, Swedish people, uh, what are the policies? This is meaningless. The real issue is people don't agree. Are their differences reconcilable or not? And you haven't answered the question. And the answer is not simple because these things change over time. And some countries and other countries really don't agree on such things. For example, France and Germany, when it comes to how work is organized, they don't agree. About how families are organized, they don't agree either. These are real issues. And if we want to have a globalized Europe, a federalized Europe, as you say, we need some kind of middle ground that's, at, to this day, kind of impossible. Up till now, the solution of the European Union is to slowly subvert everyone. That is no longer going to work. You can't just say that you have to adopt things that people don't want to do and they'll at some point they'll say no. You've lived through this previously in Hungary. This happened in Hungary, man. Like, history is going to repeat itself. Now, I think the main issue with this argument is that it views countries as these homogenous blocks. For example, even Poland has a huge conservative versus progressive divide. Polish cities are progressive, while the Polish countryside is conservative. That being said, even the most conservative European countries are slowly becoming more and more progressive. According to this Pew Research data, young people are far more accepting of LGBT rights, for example, than older people. And this is the case in every Eastern European country that we would consider conservative. Yes, young Young people are more liberal. But do you know something? When they age, they become more conservative. Incredible. And LGBT rights are not a real issue. Unfortunately, it's the only issue you cite, but it's not a real issue at all. Okay, but what about the political forces of these countries? Hungary and Poland, for example, are led by ultra-conservative far-right governments. Well, both in Poland and Hungary, if you add up the conservative and the progressive forces, they are pretty much neck and neck. And in Hungary, for example, all those huge percentage numbers that Fidesz, Viktor Orban's party produced, are essentially just one third of the population, two thirds being uh, opposition or just apolitical. In other words, this conservative versus progressive divide is not that deep. And with time, it will only get smaller. No, it won't. For example, in France, conservatives are, are winning ground here. Like, even young people are becoming conservatives because things are so bad. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. So I don't think the conservative-progressive divide would be such a big problem. I mean, we already have it and things aren't falling apart, really. Let's move on to another frequent argument, namely the rich-poor divide within Europe. And the gist of this argument is that the great wealth differences between countries, or in this case regions, would lead to all kinds of distortions, economic that is, such as internal mass migration, uh, poor regions getting abandoned, etc. France, we have a, an interesting phenomenon about this. It's about like doctors coming from other countries to, to practice here. And I've been told it's even worse in Germany. So all these people that were essentially, their education was paid by a poor country. They come to a rich country and they can live here. And that poor country just spent all of its money to get these doctors and these doctors just leave. Essentially, we're robbing poor countries that are supposed to be our allies and our friends because we're in the same union. Don't you see a problem here? And the other thing is we save money by not having to actually do the training of our doctors ourselves. Like, this is a huge issue, man. I I'm sorry, but this has started before we even federalize. Like, this is already a disaster. Y you don't, maybe you don't see it, but it's already bad. Now, of course, there are significant economic differences between European countries, but this is something that a federalized Europe could actually help solve, in my opinion. For example, a federal anti-corruption court could oversee the spending of cohesion funds, sort of like OLAF right now, but on steroids. Less corruption on the poorer ends would definitely help with the economic situation. So we're gonna trust bureaucracy to fight corruption. Bureaucracy is the origin of corruption. Essentially middle managers that don't actually have to do anything always creates corruption and we're gonna create more of them on steroids. This is just stupid. Also, a federal healthcare budget would do wonders to poorer member states. Ideally, there should be a federal minimum wage for healthcare workers paid from the central budget. For example, in every country, a doctor's minimum gross salary should be, say, 2,000 euros and nurses 1,400. Now, this wouldn't really affect Western countries where salaries are already much higher, but it would make all the difference in countries like Bulgaria, Romania, or Hungary, or even Poland. Uh, this way, we could solve the problem of healthcare 
healthcare workers migrating to the West for better pay, causing severe personal shortages back home. Uh, once again, the salaries would not need to be equal across the board, but high enough to prevent public service workers from leaving their home country en masse. So we create somewhat competitive wages all around Europe, but who is going to pay for that? Because if poor countries could pay their doctors more, they would do it themselves. So you're going to ask rich countries like Germany, the Netherlands, the northern countries to foot the bill so that you can triple the salary of, for example, Romanian doctors that are winning 500 euros so they can win like 1.5k a, a month when the country can't actually afford it. So you're going to ask fiscally responsible countries like Germany who don't want to give a cent to countries like France. You're going to ask them to pay for doctors in poor countries. Like, don't you know that this just doesn't work in Europe? Don't you know like Germany tells other countries to go fuck themselves when, when other countries ask for money? They let Greece nearly starve when they had a crisis. They don't care about other countries. I don't know who you're going to convince was your fund idea, but it just won't work. I would do the same thing with education, actually. Have a federal minimum teacher salary and bring schools up to a certain quality standard. Do you know that even in France, we have the same budget in our education as the Russian army. We can't do it. So trying to do it at like the European level is foolishness. Just foolishness. I'm an educator. I can tell you it doesn't work. A strong economy begins with a strong, well-educated workforce, as they say. Who says that? E education and value uh, are two different things. You can be taught many things and bring no value to the table. To bring value, you need practical skills or you need to actually know the value of work and how to produce work that's good. These things have nothing in common, like nothing. So I think a European Federation would actually be a great solution to wealth inequality because it could shift resources much more efficiently and most importantly, it could also check the correct spending of those resources. The European Union costs more than it actually does because it's essentially paying a middleman to do the state's job when we already have states. And there is a mechanism for checking already, called the European Prosecutor's Office, uh, from which member states can opt out freely, including Hungary. I wonder why that is. Boy, it sure sounds like resisting European integration is just a cover for politicians to preserve their power and to keep up their domestic corruption schemes without anyone able to stop them. Speaking of which, let us now talk about the national sovereignty argument. Now, national sovereignty in the face of European integration is a great lie that many still believe. Leaders like Orban tell people that more European integration will take power away from them. Them as in the people. Well, it, it will, because automatically, if they don't have the final say and we have to wait on the commission to give policies, well, what is the point of having local politicians if they can't contradict the big policies? That's what you actually said. You actually said things will be taken care of on a local level, except when it conflicts with a plan that's f from higher up. So you actually tell us that it's true. Like, it's one of the first things you said in the video. You said it will be to, to strategize our, our policies, except when it contradicts a global strategy. But the thing is, the global strategy is to take power away from the people. So... Yes, you're full of shit, as usual. In reality, if we federalized everything tomorrow, the people would still have democratic control over their decision makers, whether local or federal. The only tangible difference would be that people like Orban could no longer reign supreme within their borders. Would have a far more powerful tyrant whose armies can come from any other country to take over and destroy us if we oppose them. Essentially, we'd have a second version of the USSR, except rather than having Russian troops, there would be French or Polish or German troops that come restore order when, uh, well, when people decide that they've had enough of the European Union. And, and it's not a democracy. It's not a republic. It's a union. You vote for people that are like senators, but they don't vote on policy. They vote on whether or not policies that are brought by the commission, which you don't elect, can actually go through. And their votes and their amendments can be ignored by, by the commission that you don't elect. And... There are so many things that are bad. And the votes are really quick. There's a video of six votes in a row, and it lasts less than five minutes. It's ludicrous, like, how bad it is. And I don't know why you're defending this shit. Like, why? 
the local political ruling class would actually have some oversight. And so national sovereignty is a neat rhetorical trick used by politicians to make people believe that the local politicians losing some power is equivalent to the electorate losing power. Now this would be true if the political power was transferred to a dictatorship, but in this case we are only transferring some functions from a local democratic government to a central democratic government. So policies like defense, education, transportation, and uh, funding, energy, these are not essential things that you should have direct control over through your vote. S simply put, you're full of shit, man, because that's all the EU directives we have to respect if we want to get our money back. They already have powers. Are our politicians at home, their power is so small if they actually want to respect the EU that they can barely do anything. They can only choose what bad policies they do first. Now, the national sovereignty argument is a form of so-called EU bashing, which is the political equivalent of reactionary anti-SJW content, which can be summarized as follows. No real arguments, just vague gesturing against imagined hypocrisy. This is called poisoning the well. You don't cite the arguments. You don't cite the content. All you do is tell them they're baddies. They're just baddies. And uh, this neat definition comes from Vosh as far as I can tell. You'll find the link to his channel in the description. I is that Vosh the guy that says that child pornography is okay? Or that when people come to kill you, you can't defend yourself because the mob is right? Dude, you, you really need to actually like kind of like watch videos of the people you talk about. This has been a problem in the previous video I made about you where you talked about people without actually telling us who they were. But I'm telling you, Vosh is not a good guy. Vosh is pretty much full of shit and he admits it. There's a video where he says, I would lie about anything if it means winning a debate. He doesn't care about the truce. He, he just, he switches sides as as he wants just because he wants to win he's just full of shit and he likes child porn and and he doesn't believe that you have the responsibility to defend yourself he essentially is a moron you're citing a moron but the thing about eu bashing is that it's kind of getting old uh, people aren't so quick to jump on the bandwagon and they're increasingly seeing it for what it is a cheap political trick to divert attention from domestic problems in france we have a very unpopular president called macron and macron's all his policies come from EU directives, all of them. Education destruction is a EU policy. Transport destruction is an EU policy. Work code destructions is also a EU policy. Like all of these things come from the European Union. And the thing is, if we don't have a government that tells the EU to go fuck itself, we have to do these things. And all the politicians that support the EU, they all want to do it. And I'm sorry, but we don't want that stuff. We just don't want it. So no, it's not local versus global it's it's just local there is no such thing as a global issue in the world it's only local issues people who, who talk about global issues essentially want to colonize or take control of places where they don't live for their own profit the next big argument is about cultural differences, namely that European cultures are simply too different to work together on such a high level. So the federalization of Europe is based on a very important realization. Let me explain. I was born in Hungary, and I have a bunch of relatives in the countryside who live in villages in the east. When I visit them, I find that I have nothing in common with them or the people around them, and we have vastly different ideas about virtually everything. We eat different food, we enjoy different entertainment, we consume different media, we definitely have different drinks habits, we have different mannerisms, the list goes on. Basically, the Hungarian language is the only thing we have in common. In contrast, when I studied for a year in Germany on my Erasmus scholarship, I got to meet people like me, young, college age, middle class, with whom I had a lot in common. And those people were from all over Europe, north and south, east and west, almost every European country was represented there. And virtually the only tangible difference between us was our native languages. But we all spoke English. So by virtue of all of us there being highly educated, educated middle-class young adults, I had much more in common with people from northern Finland, southern Spain, or even eastern Russia than with my Hungarian relatives living a few hours away. And mind you, many of those Hungarian relatives are the same age as I. So this cultural differences argument doesn't really add up. It's just simply outdated. It would have made some sense in the 1950s or 60s, but ever since then the world has become much more interconnected. What you essentially say here is that you're part of the cosmopolitan elite. So you're from that very small group of people that's not actually attached to anything locally. That means 
that essentially you could go anywhere and your skill set would, would enable you to work and and uh, make a profit and live off. But the thing is, that only works because of globalization. And most people are not like that. You're essentially part of this very small cosmopolitan elite. And most people are not like that. And most people can't be like that. You are part of a class of people. Essentially, most of our resources go into educating you people. Like this cosmopolitan elite group. And most people live live at a lo- local level like maintaining infrastructure and stuff like that and making the world turn and and they can't actually afford to do what you do so essentially what i'm saying here is that you are not the normal grassroots people you are the exception to the rule essentially your worldview is biased because all you know are rich cosmopolitan people but most of the people in the world live at a local level. So essentially, they can't agree with people from other countries that also live at this normal local level. Of course, you can agree with people from that cosmopolitan bubble in your ivory tower because you were all indoctrinated by universities and by higher education. And I also went to to university and higher education. I know what happens there. They tell you that you're smart, that you're brilliant, and that you don't really need the poor, normal people that live at a local level. But that's false. That's a bias that's introduced by your education. Do you understand? I don't know if people like you can understand understand that but i'm really trying to explain it to you there's a very good book you should read that's written by george arwell it's called road to wigan pier and there's a chapter where they talk about people like you it's called about socialists i don't know i think it's chapter 12 or 13 should really read it it's really good you can find it on youtube it's it's an audio so you can listen to it and uh, you'll see it's eye-opening just remember this you are the one percent all right so the next argument we're going to be looking at is language namely that europe has no real common language and people being unable to communicate with each other would lead to chaos or you know there's just not enough linguistic cohesion for a european federation now this argument is a big one however it also suffers from the same problem as the cultural argument namely that it's becoming more and more outdated now this argument would have been fair a few decades ago but in our current day and age english is very quickly becoming the common language of europe Uh, sorry friends even in the most english illiterate countries a good fifth of the population speaks it already and with the internet and our increasingly global culture these percentages will only go up the common administrative language inside a european federation would of course be english Uh, in fact in the current european union it already pretty much is Uh, sorry friends again sorry is just a for that word with a y at the end so no this won't work i'm sorry but many countries want europe to speak their language and it can't be english English because English is already taken. Simply put, this is kind of like colonialism all over again. Do you know that what people hated about the USSR is the fact they all had to learn Russian and they all hated Russians? Are, do we have to do this again with English? Y- you really are a very limited person. Like Through all this indoctrination about central planning and believing in the system, you, you still have this s- slave mindset where you have to bow down to the overlord. It- it's quite crazy and unhealthy. No self-respecting country can accept such terms. You should have to defeat France in a war to ask this. And I think France, if it comes down to it, will wage war against Germany and other countries. Simply put, because this is too insulting to carry on forever. This means that a federal European government would not be affected by a language barrier, and I would make sure by making English courses part of public sector employment. The government pays for a private teacher or something to come by and teach for a few hours each week for free as part of the employee's work time. And in practice, this would mean that every government office would have all forms and all services available in the local language plus in English. And so this leaves us with the general populace outside of the public sphere. Now, would there be a linguistic problem? I don't think so. People already live in areas where they can access everything in their own native languages, and this would be the same under a European Federation. And there could only be problems if people would want to leave those areas and go to other areas where there's another language. But the people who do move around are usually the ones who already speak foreign languages. Here in Germany, for example, I've met a lot of fellow Hungarians who work here. They all speak German or English, and they have no linguistic issues whatsoever. Now, as an important side note, some industries at this point do not really require knowledge of the local language. Uh, For a lot of occupations like finance, IT, or even some blue-collar jobs like trucking, English is often enough. So with all this being said, I don't think the federal Europe idea would topple over because of language. It could become a problem here and there, but it could still be handled through policy. 
So yes, you believe central planning can solve all your problems, that all the insults and all the overreach and all the raw power will work out just fine. This is baffling. I can't believe it. Like every video you do about topics you know nothing about is, is just... <gasps> It's just awful. At the end of the day, the most important thing is that the government has a common language, which at this point it pretty much does. So this problem has really been solved by the circumstances, I would say, and so I'm not especially worried about it. I, I just have to say one thing. Try it. Make my day. We'll see what fucking happens w when people like you try to do this. You're gonna see how bad it's gonna ha it's gonna go. It's gonna go really badly. This thing is gonna explode quicker than dynamite. All right, so let's move on to the ultimate argument, the biggest one. Namely, European states differing geopolitical interests. Now, this right here is the most important argument of them all. And to properly address it, I'll be rolling it into why I think a European federation is absolutely necessary. All right, so why do I think that a European federation is absolutely necessary? At the end of the day, it all comes down to more efficient use of resources, both tangible and non-tangible. For example, a federal Europe should have a unified military. Instead of dozens of smaller armies operating separately, let's have a common command structure. A unified European military would be much more effective, i.e. much more stronger, for the same amount of money. And with an active war currently ongoing on European soil, meaning the war in Donbass, I think it's an absolute necessity. That doesn't work, because a military has to defend its nation. Didn't you see the Austro-Hungarians, how they fared badly, with all the different languages and everything, and all the different standards? That also means that if there's a central government, it can oppress people by using an army that's not from their country, and that doesn't care about them. That means essentially we'll have occupying forces in our sovereign nations that won't be sovereign anymore. Essentially we're, we're gonna have like inter-European colonialism, something like that, where like German armies are in like Italy or Italian armies are in France. That just won't work. That's just bad. Uh, we can't do this, and no, it's just bad, dude. It just won't work. Another hugely important aspect is common finances. A unified tax policy to end tax havens, uh, looking at you, Ireland, and things like more efficient control over budget spending. It's much easier to track corruption, it turns out, if certain states can't just opt out of the anti-corruption measure. In practice, common finances would mean the aforementioned, plus a federal budget for federal issues and local budgets for local issues. We could just have national budgets for national issues. That's what we have now. And the thing is about Europe is we have to have everybody agree on policies. And those financial havens, as, as you call them, they'll never agree. So we can, we've been trying this for years. It just doesn't work. Just this does not work. All those financial heavens, because the thing is, the European Union cannot reform itself. That's another thing we we haven't talked about at all, because everybody has to agree on things. <laughs> it's, it's just ridiculous. Also, something else that's also very important is a common defense force and asylum system. If Europe had a well-organized network of refugee camps and a unified border force, the 2015 refugee crisis would not have been so severe, I believe. Are you talking about when Merkel decided in a totally unilateral fashion to take two million refugees that nobody in Europe agreed to take and then force quotas on every other nation and threaten them with financial repercussions that's like a hostage situation that's so full of shit the crisis was self-inflicted if we had done what the Greeks the Italians and the Spanish wanted none of this would have happened we would have pushed them back to sea and they would have found another thing to do and thus the consequent far-right resurgence wouldn't have happened it was pretty amazing to see how how quickly the EU's refugee system folded back in the day, mostly because individual countries started pushing the refugees onto each other instead of working together. There was a quota system developed to help distribute some refugees among member states, but far right led countries of course started screaming about it immediately. Hungary, for example, ended up suffering a complete national mental breakdown over it for having to house 1,294 migrants and only until their asylum applications are processed. Imagine bringing somebody you don't know in your home and you have to keep him there because somebody in another country decided that you had to take them. Wouldn't you lose your mind? Do you take vagrants and migrants in your own home? If you don't, then you have nothing to say about this. You're arguing from like a position of privilege that's insane. Uh, speaking of the refugee crisis, a unified federal police could track crime across borders more efficiently, including terrorism. 
Don't we already have Interpol that does that? Is there a problem with Interpol? Can you make Interpol better before we create a new thing? Just You just want to add to the tax burden forever? A federal secret service could process all the intel much better instead of having dozens of small secret services operating parallel to each other. So we won't have things like the Hungarian secret service not noticing Salah Abdeslam, the Pataklan massacre's organizer, buying 200,000 SIM cards in Budapest. Yes, that actually happened. I even have a video about it. Feel free to check it out. Maybe our frontiers should be closed and we should actually vent people at the border rather than letting them in in an indiscriminate fashion. But the European Union does not allow us to do that, so, well, we're kind of fucked anyway. All right, so, I promised I would get to the geopolitical interests argument, so here it is. Under my community post, a lot of you have correctly identified this as a problem. However, I'll be approaching this issue from the other way around. Europe is indeed full of clashing geopolitical interests. For example, Poland is staunchly anti-Russian, while Hungary's Viktor Orban has a VIP entry card into Putin's pants. Germany is also quite ambivalent on the Russia question, since its industry depends on Russian gas. Most EU member states are against China or view it as a rival, while Viktor Orban openly collaborates with them. A united European geopolitical front, I believe, is the most important thing to have right now. Our neighbor Russia, though on the decline, is an increasingly oppressive oil monarchy with nuclear weapons, one that currently engages in active warfare on European soil. And Germany is their best friend, because they need to be, because they unilaterally decided to close all their nuclear plants at the same time, like fucking cowards. And they abandoned us all and now they fine France over nuclear power because apparently the European Union says that nuclear power is bad and it's not it's not ecological whereas it's a complete contrary the only thing that really works and we have ever growing power needs and the Germans are burning gas which is helping global warming and they're going back to coal which is also working in global warming and it's a growing disaster and and we have we can do nothing because Germany essentially takes all those unilateral decisions and then Europe has to go with them. Germany chooses a austerity, we have to go with it. Uh, Germany chooses to have migrants, we have to go with it. They choose to destroy the energy market in Europe by closing their plants, we have to go with it. I'm sorry, man, but like, this European Union cannot be a front because the Germans, I, I know they want to conquer Europe and they've tried twice before, at least, and, and they're doing it again now and we have to say no to them. We have to say no to them in every way and why does Orban Orban go to, Ru to the Russians because he has nowhere else to go. Why does he go to the Chinese? Because nowhere else to go. Because in Europe, if you're not in lockstep with Germany, if you're a, a weaker southern economy, you have to, to do policies that go against what your people want. And, and nobody wants to do that. And I'm sorry, but this won't work. China is a totalitarian tech dystopia and a new global superpower. India is an upcoming superpower. I guess they couldn't do it by 2020, but it's coming still. Even if Russia collapsed tomorrow and they wore Donbass ended, that still leaves us with China and India as rivals. Well, they're superpowers, but this does not really concern us because we can kind of insulate ourselves from those negative things and kind of build our own world that's comfortable and nice. Isn't that what we've been doing for a hundred years? Like As they grow stronger, I don't think European countries will be able to do anything against their influence unless they present a unified front. Which is impossible because... European countries have different interests. For example, Germany will betray us to Russia because they're already the best of friends. And most countries still want to go and trade very closely with the US and the UK, which are no longer in the EU. So that's another problem. And also the slower economies of Europe are not really benefiting from the European Union. The European Union is destroying their industry, which is putting them back. Also, the European Union is robbing them of all their workers, which are leaving for better countries. Countries. So no, this won't work. The northern countries just want to take everything they can and leave. So I don't know what we're going to do. Like this European fairy tale is over. People don't really realize the insane power potential these countries have. And their glaring weaknesses, like the fact that China's population is aging quicker than ours. And they have no social safety net for those old people. And they have 300 million people that work in fields that are pretty much slaves. And if they ever want any rights, they'll probably have to throw down the, the communist state that exists. And the fact that India is completely disunified and all the provinces are striving against each other like European nations so we can kind of we can kind of cruise through all these difficulties if we play our cards right but as a global Europe we could do it better of course but we're we don't have a global Europe because 
some countries just want their things and don't really care about the rest. There is no sacrifice in the European Union. It's only countries bickering on details to try to, to, to fuck with other countries next to them. Uh, for the sake of perspective, Slovenia has a population of 2 million, Hungary 10 million, Germany 83 million. Meanwhile, India has 1,366 million and China 1,398 million. Now, of course, number of people is not the end all be all, but they serve as a good basis for future power. And people are resources after all human resources. Alone, European countries are just figures on the chessboard of global powers. Together, they can become a global power themselves. Gone are the times when the UK, Germany or France alone could be a significant force on the global stage. We are now entering a new age of global powers. When you actually care about people, you don't give a shit about the gross product. What's important is the gross product by capita and the buying power that the people have. And having a, slow popula a small population is better because it makes the per capita index better, which actually makes people's lives better. So no, you're wrong. It, it, it's it's big populations are more of a problem than anything else because it, it makes logistics impossible and also it makes political representation impossible. That's why big countries like India and China, well, they seem strong, but they're not that strong when everything is compiled at the end of the day. So far, Europe could surf the waves of US hegemony, but new players are coming to the table. And because of this, a united European front is necessary. And of course, of course, it has to be under Germany, under their hegemony, and their friends are Russia, so we can't actually do anything to protect ourselves, and we have to give up everything that makes our countries good, because we have to follow directives that are issued by people we didn't elect. That's what you fucking want for Europe, essentially the USSR volume 2. Now I can see why people would find the idea of a European Federation strange, scary, or even outright impossible. It's actually natural to feel that way ahead of every major paradigm shift in governance. I I imagine people must have felt the same way about the first European nation state back in the day, uh, how it's impossible for a country to last outside of Vatican influence, how Henry VIII is too much of an idealist, how the Anglican church will tear England apart, and so on. But in the end, it worked out pretty okay. Uh, until June 2016, that is. Alright, so now all of you should have a much better idea about how a federal Europe would look like. But what are the chances for the emergence of a federal Europe? Well, they're pretty good, I must say. Currently, support for the EU is pretty much green, or I should say blue, across the board. Also, crucially, most people in most European countries want more decisions to be taken on the EU level. Well, this video is aged very badly. It seems like people would support a reasonable re-delegation of power to EU institutions. Until they hear any argument against that pile of dog shit. And I think a common foreign policy would be such a measure, and also a common military, a common fiscal policy, and common non optional anti-corruption institutions, among other things. And once again, none of this is science fiction. Most people in most European countries trust all major European institutions. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You are maybe a comic in your original country, but here I would tell you, no. The support is really waning in most countries. You can believe the propaganda you see on TV, but honestly, it is not very serious. The EU's trust rating is finally recovering after the 2008-2009 economic crisis. And in recent years, COVID-19 has only shown people the need for even closer European integration. Common EU vaccine procurement was generally a success, despite the rough start. The idea was that European countries together have much, much more leverage than alone when negotiating with pharma companies. And, well, you know, duh. Alright, so let us now move on to the last section, namely how I would have the federalization process play out. One word, incrementally. This is already what they're doing. So what they're doing is they're giving directives and then they're forcing countries to slowly implement them. So it's essentially taking away the flack from the horrible EU policies and trying to put them on individual national politicians. So when the politicians don't want to do it, they're called extremists. They try to discredit them and to ruin, ruin their careers. So essentially it's, it's subversion. They're trying to subvert the European nation states so they kill themselves. You have politicians in Brussels who have actual power and then you have national politicians just have to make people accept the decisions taken in Brussels by people that are not elected, essentially the commission. And we have to pay for two sets of politicians and the ones in Brussels are completely out of our control. And the ones at home, we could get new ones, but they still have to do what the ones in Brussels say. So essentially we're screwed. We can't do anything about it. And we can't even modify the EU because to modify anything in the EU, we have 
to have the votes of everyone agreeing because it's, it, it's unanimous. Any decision is unanimous. So what we have is we have bureaucrats running a, a supranational nation, a union. But it's not a democracy. It's not a republic. There is no referendum. When you vote and you don't vote for the EU, what they do is they say that you voted poorly and then you can r vote again. In France, in 2005, people voted against against the EU and then some shitty candidate we had, when he got elected, he just passed the thing anyway. In Romania, they voted against twice and the third time, well, it passed because you had to have it was not it, it it was not about it was not about getting it passed it was about stopping it you needed to stop it it was not vote if you're for it it's vote if if you're against it and the people didn't vote enough so it passed automatically it, essentially it, it goes against every republican and democratic thing we have it's autocratic and it's complete shit the measures i've mentioned will of course take years upwards to a decade to implement i don't want to do any of these things uh, just overnight i want to make a plan for deeper integration start executing it in phases and correct the course if something doesn't seem to be working out. And I do think it will be extremely important to sell this idea to people, gradually. Now normally I don't think an idea like this would need to be sold, since it has objective, tangible benefits that any reasonable person would want. It should have benefits. And we've tried it. It has failed. It has become autocratic. It has become corrupted. And people want to leave. The problem, as always, is the reactionary counter campaign that will inevitably follow. Or a disinformation propaganda, to use a non-PC term. You know, the UK's EU membership had tangible, objective benefits that any reasonable person would want. Maybe you could have cited them, but you didn't. So, there is no claim, except that they're good. And a claim of goodness is worthless. And, oh boy how's that Brexit thing working out so far, huh? Their most iconic slogan, in fact, was a complete lie. And people need to be equipped against this. The disinformation, that is. The source of which nowadays is an increasingly reactionary modern conservatism. Citation needed. Oh, now I'll have to make a video about this, won't I? So anyway, as we've seen, the federalization of Europe wouldn't be the founding of the galactic empire or something. It would be a set of mostly bureaucratic processes, building upon what has already been done so far, which would affect our local political ruling classes first and foremost. Most. And I do believe people will only benefit from this. Tell that to the Romanians. Tell that to the French. Tell that to the English that left and are feeling better. Tell that to the Italians, which were drawn to the wolves. Oh, and also, when the next capital riot actually succeeds, the free world would need to be led by someone else. Your video is pedantic. It's full of lies. You don't know anything about the European Union. You don't tell us how it works. Because if you told us how it works, nobody would want it. And it, it, it's so vague. You don't define any of your terms. And, you, and the Capitol riot, man, it, it, it was not a riot. It was like a protest. They let them in. Cops opened the door and the people came in. It's a public building where there were no politicians and no civic leaders. It was ridiculous. And none of the people are charged with anything. What the hell are you talking about? You came from a communist country. You should know that, simply put, it's impossible to, to, to reform one of those big, shitty superstructures once it's created. And this has already started in Europe. And it will not end until people tell it to go away. And I think France will probably be one of the next countries to leave it. And I'll tell you this. People won't shed a single tear for this. Everybody will be happier. And the Germans can do their League of Northern Countries and slowly give every small country to the east of them to the Russians. Starting with Ukraine and then maybe one of those small states like Estonia. And I would like, I I would like it to be in another in another way, but it won't be. Simply put, like because the Germans are irresponsible and incompetent, so we're screwed. The European Union is done. 